I now call this committee of the whole the Davenport Community School District Board of Directors to order. Would everyone please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, we will move on. Uh, subject 1.04, phase one recommendation from Bray. I will turn it over to the superintendent. Thank you. Tonight we have two presentations. The first one is gonna be delivered by uh, Mr. Flynn. We wanted to give the board an update um, on just exactly what our transitions have been so far for the school year and, and, and how we plan to move forward. So, um, I just wanted to notate for the record that Director Gordon is participating via Zoom. Thank you. And so the second, the second presentation that we have tonight is uh, the first viewing of the recommendation of phase one. Um, and so we'll get into the introducing that afterwards. But we wanted to really give uh, the board an opportunity to see and hear all the work that's gone into the transitioning of after the clo building closures and and the movement of staff. I will tell you, I'm, inc I'm incredibly uh, proud of the work that's gone into these very, this very difficult decision, this very difficult time. Um, and that, that effort has been led by Mr. Flynn and Mr. Ermanski, and they've, they've worked their tails off to make sure that our people have what they need during this difficult transition. So with that being said, I'll turn it over to Mr. Ermanski and Mr. Flynn. Thank you, and I would really like to just thank everybody for giving us a chance to give you an update on where we are uh, and where we're going to be going over the course of the next couple months. Um, first, this has been a really a fluid process um, in terms of all of the, the different balls that are in the air. Uh, so there have been a lot of people with their hands in the work. Um, I, Superintendent Schneckeloth just mentioned Mr. Romanski. Mr. Postkane has been uh, heavily involved in this. And there are just a lot of stakeholders uh, involved up and down uh, the aisle who have given their thoughts and helped us to put the best plan that we can in place. Um, so just a, it has truly been a team effort. And I would just like to I would be very remiss if I didn't thank everybody for the work that's gone on so far. So that work itself, um, as as you all know, it started in February. Um, Teachers were placed into the pool from the three buildings that were closed. Uh, then we had letters that were sent out to all of our elementary families regarding where they would be going in terms of their enrollments from that point forward. Um, in March, we started a, a committee, and actually it was probably late February. Um, it was formed to develop transition events for students and for staff uh, and, and for our families. Um, in the month of March was when we uh, had the open or the transfer option request form available for our families and we'll talk about that in later slides um, and in April we worked very hard to put processes and procedures in place for the actual moves that will happen uh, come June uh, of this school year when our students are out for the summer and we'll talk through some of those classroom pieces in, in a slide here in just a couple minutes as well. Uh, the transition events that the committee had planned, and the committee, just so that everybody understands the composition of that committee, um, was compri it's currently comprised of the three principals from the buildings that are closing, uh, three other elementary principals, one from each region in the district. Uh, there are two teachers on the committee, um, both of which uh, are, are special education teachers. And then there are a variety of other uh, personnel who show up when they can. Aaron Rome, uh, Jen Van Fleet, Shaney Ford, and, and the ILDs as well. So this group has worked to develop some plans, cascade those plans to their peers and then to the buildings and to bring that information back so that we're really trying to hit um, our families, our students, and our other stakeholders as we make these transitions uh, or a transition into the district with uh, three fewer buildings. So in April, uh, 
welcome slideshows were developed and communicated to our stakeholders. These were made available both on district and on building websites, e-blasted out. Um, this really was a, a format for information to be shared in which uh, there was just an introduction. Mission and vision statements were shared, social media outlets, um, and parent involvement opportunities at new buildings, um, as long as or as well as contact information for our families, so that they could um, just learn a little bit more about the the building that that they would be a part of in the year ahead. Uh, in addition, uh, we had a transition event last week. I think it was like, it might have been the week before. Um, times when the calendars kind of run together on me. Uh, but Jim Van Fleet and Shaney Ford put together uh, an event and involved their principals uh, for our families to come learn more about their buildings and to meet administrators um, here at the ASC. In June, uh, we are planning to have building tours available for all of our families and students. Um, these are planned for June 6th at two or June 5th and 6th, two different time frames, uh, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. Um, again, this is going to be a chance for our families to visit the buildings that will be new to them, to become acclimated with the physical structure of the building, and to meet uh, the administrator at said building. So uh, along with that, our principals have been fielding requests from families um, throughout uh, the last three months, and they're really trying to accommodate families as they're making requests for information and to do those things right now. Uh, and then the other thing that's being planned as a transition event for our students and families, um, we are planning a transition academy in August um, when we return to the buildings. Uh, we are very much in the planning stages here, but we're enlisting the help again of Shaney Ford, who's been um, tasked in the past with the Kinder Academy. Um, so we're going to model our transition academy along those lines. Um, we want to provide meaningful experiences for our students as they enter the building for the first time. We want them to feel a sense of belonging to a new school community. Um, and we're going to be very, very purposeful in planning those things so that kids and families have every chance uh, to feel good about the school year when it starts a couple weeks thereafter. Uh, the, the building closures in terms of uh, pieces for our staff, talked a little bit earlier about the fact that our, our teachers in those buildings and our, all of our other staff, our custodians, our paras, our secretaries, um, were all made away, aware right away that after the, the decision was made that the buildings would be closed. Um, there were a few different timetables involved in terms of the staffing itself. Um, the teachers we wanted to make sure that we worked quickly on. Um, because of uh, hiring, there were a couple other bargaining groups that actually wanted to wait as long as they could to start the process because they wanted to have as many positions available as they could. Um, so there's there are two different time frames, but uh, in terms of the teachers, uh, our, our HR department, Jamie Weinzerl's leadership, just was outstanding. They developed a process that was very, very logical, very sequential, and it was transparently communicated to everyone. Um, and the teachers from those three buildings were placed within two days. And that involved things like providing coverage for classes when teachers had to make decisions, um, uh, having a way of communicating the changes in real time so that people knew what positions were, were available. Um, really, all hands were on deck, and, and that process really went very, very well. Um, from that point forward, uh, we, have, we have been openly communicating with our teachers and our staff about uh, timelines for moving materials from buildings. The plan right now is to have all of that done, and I think I'll go into this a little bit later, but um, have that all done in the month of June. So we'll have a week where we're moving teachers and staff's belongings from Buchanan, one week from Monroe, one week from Washington, and there's a schedule laid out, um, and Josh and his team have done a great job of readying things so that um, teachers can pack their things, it can be labeled, and it can be um, taken by region on different days during the week. So um, we feel pretty good about the plan that we have in place right now. Like I said earlier, there are, there are things that continually come up and force us to reassess where we're at, um, but we, we feel good about where we are. Uh, I, I stated that 
so some of the supplies have been delivered, some of the boxes, some of the labels are in buildings. We have a store of others that are going to be available as well, but we sent procedures out to all of our staff, um, and that's all staff, about um, the moves that are going to take place. We're going to provide up to 12 hours of paid time for staff members to pack and unpack. Um, it was important to us that we honored the time involved, knowing that our teachers and our paras and, and everyone else at these three buildings um, are, are responding to something that they didn't necessarily have, have a, a choice in, so to speak. And we wanted to make sure that um, we, were, we were doing right by them as they, they pack and they, they get ready for the next school year. So um, that is all happening. Um, we, Mr. Phillips has done a great job of taking inventory of all of the items in our buildings. We're talking classroom furniture, and I'll talk a little bit about this on the next slide. Classroom furniture, teacher desks, teacher um, wardrobes, all the things that you could think of that are in those buildings and uh, coordinate in a way to get that information to our staff. And I'll talk about that here, like I said. Uh, but the other pieces that we've had to consider with this schedule are the fact that um, there are technology updates that will be happening during the school year. There's summer school going on. So we've really had to be um, conscious of all the pieces that play into what happens in these buildings. Um, and I, again, it's a work in progress, but I'm very proud of uh, the work that people have put in so far. Uh, the other piece I did want to mention, our teacher restore. This is a great opportunity for all of our teachers because there are moves from building to building, but also moves within our buildings um, as space is being reallocated for the year. Um, we've encouraged our teachers to use this as a time to reassess the instructional materials that they have in their classrooms. Um, but we are also uh, working, and Sarah McGlynn is, is the teacher who has done the work with the Teacher Restore. Um, she's working very hard to make sure that we have that available and that our teachers know where that will be so that they can access some of the materials that, um, that are, are being donated to that cause. I went into this a little bit slide early. Um, there's been a team that's been meeting on a weekly basis that's included our operations staff, people from purchasing, also our LIS department to make sure that there are hopefully no stones unturned as we move these items. Um, but we, we put together a process for moving the assets that, that we have based on first the needs of the students moving from these closing buildings to other buildings. Secondly, that we're addressing upgrade needs in current buildings with some of the things that are in the Buchanan, Monroe, and Washington. And lastly, based on principal requests. So um, a process has been set up where principals can, they can see, um, Brian Phillips put together a spreadsheet that has hyperlinks to pictures that I could never do myself, but our principals have access to this information so they can see the assets that are there and available, and they can then um, fill out a form requesting those assets, um, you know, once, we, once the dust settles. So um, there's a plan for all of that. Uh, there's a plan for technology to follow our teachers and our students from building to building. Um, you know, we are really trying to take the onus of the move off of the people who will be affected by the move. So we don't want our teachers to have to worry about getting their items from one building to the other. We want them to pack a box and we will take care of that for them. And we're going to continue down that road. The uh, request for transfer option. As we talked about earlier, um, these requests were done uh, utilizing a Google form. It was important for us that we, um, because that window was so tight, it was a March 1 to March 31st timeline for that. We needed to make sure that we had timestamps and that we were doing everything in a, in a process um, that could be easily understood and that we could um, have the information needed to explain decisions that would have to be made regarding our transfer options. Um, we have had staff, and I have to tip my cap, Kelsey Nyrink is the administrative assistant that has put a lot of time into the um, process itself of this request was made, here's how much space is available, et cetera. She's done an outstanding job of, of really owning the, the process itself. Um, and the requests were processed and are 
we're almost to a point where we will be communicating this with everyone. We were hoping that that would go out in advance of today's meeting. Um, however, we ended up having 738-ish um, requests for transfer option. The logistics that went into that um, just caused it to take a little bit longer. But we are we are optimistic that the communication to families will go out in the, the days ahead. Um, but we base those, pro those requests on first, families who are displaced due to boundary changes. Secondly, families requesting to stay put at buildings. And then third, just kind of the traditional transfer option. So that has been the sequence of, of how we've tried to structure that. And like I said, we're hoping that the, the communication will go out to families this week. That is the hope. So um, again, I, I made mention of Kelsey and I'll leave that. She's just done a great job. And then some upcoming events. Uh, we do have part of the transition team's charge has been to create closing ceremonies and to develop kind of a protocol for those at each of the closing buildings. Um, so Buchanan's closing ceremony um, is set right now for May 11th from 5 to 6.30, and there will be invitations coming out as well, just so that I, I don't want everybody to think this is the only time you'll be seeing this information. Um, on the 17th of May, we are going to be hosting professional development for the teachers that are moving at the buildings that they will be going or that they will be teaching at next year. Um, so they are going to be... Um, asked to go to those buildings they will be compensated for their travel and all of those things but we wanted the principals receiving these teachers to have the opportunity to welcome them to their staff and really we wanted our new teachers to have a, a real world feel of what the professional development will be like and what the staff is like in their new buildings uh, June 1st we have closing ceremonies tentatively scheduled at Monroe and Washington. And I would just say that the times and dates, because that's so tight, we're still working to spread those out because we want everyone to, especially everyone at the table right now, to have the opportunity to be at those if they so choose. Um, and I know it's important for Superintendent Schneckloth that there's some space there as well. So with that, that's a really brief and broad overview of the work that's gone on. I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Director Beck. Um, I, I have a couple of questions. Um, so uh, I love all the recycling of everything or the, the teacher restore, that's a great idea. Um, so actually I have three questions. Were all the teachers able to be accommodated that wanted to be accommodated? Um, like all the teachers and all the staff any paras that requested to, uh, that weren't planning to leave the district accommodated with positions and everything. We didn't have any issues with that. Yes, and at this time, all of our teachers um, have, have been placed into positions in okay. the district. Um, we are still, our paras, that process has just begun for okay. them. The custodial group will be later because of the work that will need to go on after the buildings are closed even to get things squared away. So there's a plan for each of the bargaining groups. The teachers are done and the others will be done in the, in the weeks and months ahead. Okay. Um, so my second question is, are there volunteers um, to help with packing? Um, I know uh, our student board members had, had started to put something together. Um, I know it can be very intimidating to pack up a bunch of stuff, even if somebody has given you all the boxes and things. Um, and Josh, and, but you go ahead and then I'll jump on. There was a, a smaller group that had volunteered to do some stuff, so we're working them and do our plan where we can. Okay. Um, but not a, a big undertaking, but we, go, we're, we're gonna use them where we can. Okay, I mean, not everybody wants somebody to help them pack either, so. Yep. There's some other groups that Mr. Flynn may share or something. Okay. That, yeah, and we're working on some other processes to try and involve some of our other school groups to help with this work. Uh, the big piece is the packing is one piece, the moving the boxes mm -hmm. um, both to a centralized location to get them onto trucks and then into the new buildings will be the other parts of that. So right. they're going to need to be a lot of hands to make yeah. the work light. Yeah, school groups are a great idea for that. Um, so my last 
question is about transfer options. Um, I was just curious about, I know we normally have a certain number of transfers, students who are going to school in a different in elementary school in a not their boundary school. Compared to a normal year, have we seen an uptick in requests to go to a school that you're not boundaried in or? And I unfortunately would not be able to answer that question without doing some digging okay. um, just because this has been my first year um, and I'm going to play the newbie card just one time. <laughs> this is my first year um, in this spot, but I could definitely get that information and, and have it in the Friday report. Okay. If I'm just curious because we do have, you know, obviously I, I totally understand displaced families being the priority, but we do have a number of families that have traditionally been at a different school than the one that they are boundary to. And I think, um, I'm just curious to know, you know, how many of those we were able to keep accommodated. And we should have all of those stats um, as soon as the communication happens. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks. Yep. Director Klein, Cheryl. Um, I know teachers have normally had to do textbook inventory in those three buildings. Are they having to do it themselves? Yes, we're following similar protocols in terms of um, the scanning of the books. You know, the process is the same. Um, what we've tried to do, though, because we have teachers that not only want the curriculum, to, you know, their own things to go with them. They, if they're going grade to gr same grade to same grade, they wanted the materials to come with them. Um, we have processes in place for that so that the we don't have to handle it twice, once going to the warehouse, once going to the building. It's gonna be just a straight move um, for those teachers going same grade to same grade. Um, and the libraries, you said uh, principals could put in a request. Is that for the library materials or how are we dealing with three whole libraries going somewhere else? So glad you asked that because I forgot to put it in. Um, Jen Van Fleet, who is a former teacher librarian, um, has been, been very, very, um, not, I don't, helpful isn't even the word. She's done a great job of working with some companies to try and get an idea of what the work would look like. Um, she has put together a task team that's going to work to not, not knock over a microphone and to um, put a process in place for getting those assets to the new buildings. Um, the nice thing is at this point in time, that's not as much of a time concern as moving teacher items are. So we have a little bit more time to work with those things, uh, but she's laid out a timetable. Um, and again, a lot of those assets, we're trying to keep them so they're following students, but then filling holes in collections in other buildings as well. So she's doing a great job of taking the inventory, um, working through the inventories at the other buildings, culling materials out so that we can bring these materials in as, as they become available. You asked about <clears throat> curriculum material before too, but Sam Phillips has been working pretty deeply on that as well as I think she has a couple of tempet wills coming this summer to work through those curriculum assets also. Director Potts. Have, have we done any uh, it, like inventorying of any of the historical things that might be in these buildings, plaques, um, furniture, Ledgers, I know when, when uh, we took the safe out at Sudlow, we found handwritten ledgers from 1920 with salaries and, you know, so-and-so was paid for the month $102 and stuff. Uh, have we done anything on that line so that the museum may be able to get a hold of some of this stuff? I think some of it started already, but nothing like a direct list going down or anything like that. But yeah, you, we do have a, a part of our program set up so that we can start doing those things. And I know the museum has reached out to certain buildings. I know that um, Tammy Conrad at Washington has said that she's been in touch with the museum about certain pieces there. Um, each of the three principals in those buildings has been asked to kind of survey things and take uh, take an inventory of things that might be of interest or things that as a district we know we shouldn't be parting with for those reasons. Director Posture. <clears throat> On your closing ceremonies, are you just trying to target the students or the families also? 
really the, the focus has tried to be holistic. The, the student, is, <coughs> student is definitely one piece. The families are another piece, but there are community members too that want to, I would assume, are going to want to go in and have a chance to walk a building one last time. So we're really trying to, to provide that format um, for all, all three of those. Well, the, and for the families, like Buchanan, you've got it from 5 to 6.30. I was just wondering about Monroe and Washington, where you have it at noon and 1 o'clock. I mean, is that going to fit into most families as far as attending that? would be difficult and that that is when I said those times and dates might be adjusted I think we're gonna have to look at that so that we can involve those folks thank you though for that director director Hayes for the um, meetings on the 14th the 9 the 11 and the 4 to 6 are those going to be ran simultaneously at all three buildings that families can come in either of those times or what does that look like actually those tours will be at the new buildings so yeah we are we're um, doing that at every building that will be receiving so all the buildings that are staying open we'll use those two time slots for those tours okay thank you director gordon did you have any questions You cut out. Am I already? Thank you. Okay. Uh, Director Poston actually asked the question I was going to ask about the time slots. Um, but from this perspective up here, I think the process has been very transparent. Um, I think the districts went above and beyond trying to meet people where they are to make sure people are informed and all that. And I'm glad to see about the uh, closing ceremonies and things like that. I think that'll be a, a cool thing. And maybe people want to walk away with a brick from a building or something. Who knows? So, and then you got a second part of this. Does anyone have any questions on this first part? Uh, John and Josh, thank you so much for putting that together. John, I know you've got somewhere to go, so thank you for sticking around. Appreciate it. John John did the majority of this, and he did a great job. So just give him all the credit. He's been doing a good yeah, job the whole time. Doing he awesome. gave a lot of people credit, but he deserves it. Absolutely. The second part of our presentation is the initial look at phase one um, recommendation that we're hoping to have voted and approved in an upcoming meeting. Um, so the work can begin because it's very important work. There's a couple of key things that Josh and I want to highlight uh, before we get started. And, and John, in John's fashion, is going to highlight those same things all throughout the presentation. Um, it's very important for the, the cadence of this information to be um, to start with the board. And so while we have mentioned and talked about these things, the first initial blush had to be here with the school board and so everything you're going to see tonight are preliminary plans they're just ideas it goes back to how we have been operating in this in this uh, long-range facility plan from the beginning there are there are periods in time where we have to wait for the to get the direction from the board but the board would not want us to sit on our hands so you will see ideas thoughts concepts in here but there have been no building feedback in them. And so you know once we get our direction from the board, yeah, that sounds like a direction to go, that this team will absolutely do that in a very similar fashion that we did with Davenport West. Um, and so that the cadence is really important that the information start and direction start from our board. So we're gonna gather feedback tonight and then move forward to approve. The second component of this is, is that we, we have a, a dollar amount range, and it's really, really important to know that Kevin has been going back and forth with Susan Gerlach um, to really start nailing down those numbers. And uh, so it's, tonight, Kevin will speak to our numbers at about exactly to a little bit, yeah. But more information will be coming from that, and so we'll be putting that in a Friday report and continuing to report out. 
the the reasoning for that is the the dollars and the um, and the information is from the pr the first time Susan presented it to us, and we just want to make sure that nothing has changed in what has it been six or seven months, and a lot has changed in the last six or seven months, and so uh, given time we can speak to that stuff as well. Um, Josh, do you have anything to add to that? I think <clears throat> looking at this from where we've come to where we are now, we were we were looking at a lot of things from like a satellite view, I feel like, um, a few months back. We've now lowered to like an airplane type view and we'll continue coming coming a lot closer in, into what our view is. So when you see drawings, understand a lot of that stuff is still fluid. We had to we had to we had to meet with some people and get a little bit closer with our numbers and narrow some things down. But again, there's a lot to shift and, and be fluid about this plan. So um, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Also, I would suggest keeping your questions to the end so that um, we can kind of go through it. There might be a few things we answer throughout the process. So um, make a list and feel free to give us feedback at the end. We'll answer them the best we can. All right. <clears throat> so thanks for having me this evening. Uh, this is a presentation that we all worked on together, uh, trying to summarize. <clears throat> um, Back in March, when the board met and we talked through uh, a potential listing of phase one goals, that set the stage of where our investigation needed to go uh, to further our efforts. And so uh, this presentation tries to capture that. So we're going to start by just quick highlight of what is all included in the phase one listing, cover a couple of highlights. Uh, and then talk just real 10,000-foot uh, view timeline, possibly some future phases of, of consideration, and then we'll kind of go back through and discuss in more detail as, as you would like to uh, uh, pick back through these uh, projects. So uh, the first thing that everyone wanted to note is that what's being shown are all the highest priority projects. So it's not uh, necessarily that one project has a higher priority than any, another. However, in these initial projects, it would probably be broken down that the projects that are uh, improvements to meet the classroom needs of the students would be the highest priority. And the second priority would be uh, projects which meet the outdoor activity needs of students. And so, uh, those projects consist of expansion and renovation at Sudlow, and expansion and renovation at SMART, science room and classroom expansion and remodeling at North High School, elementary school remodeling and improvements, high school outdoor turf fields for North and West, a turf field and also a uh, baseball field solution for Central High School. These projects that are listed, uh, there's a lot involved in them. Uh, the best guess as where we're sitting right now is a range of cost of 146 million to 154 million. That uh, range is gonna be dependent on a number of factors. Some of that is the continued development of how the project would move forward. Some of that is related to market conditions and uh, uh, costs of labor and materials. Currently, we've discussed that there's an available district funding of approximately $170 million. However, that is something that Suzanne Gerlach is in the process of investigating. Kevin, I don't know if you have any other info there. Suzanne's working on her numbers now. This morning, she had four bond sales. So when TJ mentioned six, eight, whatever months ago, we all know the markets have changed significantly, let alone the cost of materials and so forth. But she's going to have a much better feel for where that's at. She also knows where sales tax revenue is coming in. So all those variables that were discussed at a prior meeting where she presented all have changed a little bit, and she's going to update her numbers and be able to get us dialed in to a, an appropriate amount. So the other thing to note is this is not an attempt to spend all of the money. There's a, a goal of reserving back a certain amount of funds because there is a need to utilize those funds for regular ongoing 
uh, needs within the district. And so, uh, again, it's trying to uh, back off some of the ongoing annualized need from the district and working within a, a range of, of available funds after that. As we look into the, to the projects, again, Sudlow, Smart, North, something that happens at all the elementary schools, and then something that happens for each of the high schools. These are uh, developed through uh, the Long Range Planning Committee, involvement of the district leadership, the cabinet, uh, building principals have been involved, and uh, that group will have to continue to grow so that we get more voices involved in this process as, as we go. What we'd like to do is just talk a, a little bit about what's involved in these projects. Uh, you will see some floor plans. Uh, those are uh, quick shots at resolving some exploration of need uh, to help us understand is it possible or not. And so those are not a final answer. Those are not the best answer. Those are the answer that helps us understand are we able to move in this direction and keep moving forward. And so uh, we'll talk about the thought process, but know that there's a lot of work to be done as, as we look at those. So we're gonna start with the middle schools. Sudlow and Smart. So an addition and renovation would be uh, needed at both Sudlow and SMART, uh, now identified as middle school buildings, uh, considering that they would be six through eight curriculum. Uh, as we've talked in the past, the existing seventh and eighth grade programs have moved into pretty much any available space within the existing building, um, which is used to provide uh, curriculum programs and services for the students that are currently attending there. So improving those buildings would allow sufficient space for all the grade levels, plus provide the necessary space to house the additional resources, programs, and services, uh, which would help improve the student outcomes given the fact that we're gonna now have a greater number of students within those buildings and recognizing that what you teach and how you do it has changed over time since uh, those buildings had a larger capacity within them. Uh, this also gives a chance uh, to improve and enhance the vision of education within the district. Uh, this would give you the idea of creating a new and improved environment that will help, again, retain students in the district, attract new families, and uh, also help in uh, attracting and retaining staff that works in these buildings. At SMART and at Sudlow, the addition and renovation uh, is based off of what is necessary to support a middle school curriculum. So that's the seventh and eighth plus the addition of sixth. It'll, uh, it is um, an approach that um, also will give us the opportunity to correct a lot of issues that we found through the facility study process. So when we talk about costs related to SMART and Sudlow, we're gonna to try to fix all the things that we've identified as problematic in those buildings. We'll be able to provide needed uh, collaboration and flexible use areas, uh, which also will give us the ability to increase sight lines and, and enhance supervision within the building. Uh, a general approach to enhance safety and security in the building is necessary as we grow those buildings to handle this, this new setup. It's also important that we are able to try to and adapt a house model within the academic wings of the building. And in that, it's best described, unfortunately, John Flynn left, but uh, he says it very well. It's that we're trying to take a big building and make it small. And so for each of the grade levels, trying to create a smaller community within the building, which uh, does help uh, improve the relational and social development of those students. It helps improve uh, student academic engagement and it is an environment which is proven to enhance uh, student outcomes. Um, Sudlow and SMART were identified as the initial projects of all the middle schools because they do have the most need of all the middle school buildings. So we're gonna start with Sudlow. <clears throat> Some of the highlights. Uh, we do need to expand the cafeteria. Um, there, 
both Sudlow and Smart have limited cafeterias. I'm sure Director Potts could tell a few stories about <laughs> that. Uh, but this gives us the opportunity to improve this efficiency for how lunch is handled, which uh, should result in better control of the students within that zone, which also will help uh, provide more instructional time because we're not bogged down with trying to cycle a lot of kids through a small amount of space. Um, we do need to provide additional classroom space to meet the needs of additional students and also additional programs, as well as to uh, re-envision the buildings with a house approach. Additional gymnasium space to provide uh, uh, opportunities for more instruction. Uh, it is hard to handle the number of students in the buildings, uh, even as they are with a single gym. Uh, having a double gym or something larger just gives more opportunity to have additional program time. Uh, at Sudlow, it's very important that whatever solution we uh, employ here works with maintaining the Creative Arts Academy space within that building. So uh, both that's an asset to the building, but creates a burden on the solution because that takes some of the space that we would otherwise uh, be able to utilize, and so that might mean a, a little bit larger addition is required there. Uh, other goals for Sudlow were trying to improve and enhance spaces related to FCE, CTE, and STEM. Uh, in fact, STEM is something that is uh, not super prevalent, and so to be able to include that there becomes an enhancement for the students and an opportunity as they prepare for moving into their high school experience. Uh, could, this, could you tell us what FCE, CTE is? Uh, so uh, FCE is uh, family and consumer sciences. So uh, uh, think of your uh, traditional kitchen type of setting within a, a school building. Uh, at Sudlow, that's a, a room that's uh, old <laughs> and <laughs> uh, needs, some, needs some attention. And uh, CTE is best thought of as your traditional industrial arts or vocational technology programs. And so uh, it is important to start to give students an introduction to those programs and courses, again, as they're preparing for their high school experience. Um, Sudlow is a large building on a very small campus. So it is very important to try to improve site safety, logistics, parking and also still maintain good opportunities for playgrounds and green space and hardscapes so that uh, we're adequately covering the needs of outdoor activity spaces. Uh, to do this, it would require the removal of the Washington Elementary Building. So from a snapshot view, uh, this is looking at the Google satellite image of the Sudlow uh, campus. Uh, you can see where Washington currently sits is identified as creating green space and some additional parking. Uh, recognizing again that uh, as we bring more students into the building, we're also bringing more staff and uh, for special events that also uh, creates a need for more parking. So more parking, making sure we have opportunities to better separate cars and buses uh, and pedestrians as we're moving about the site. So some of that's uh, considered as we start to look at how we plan this out. Uh, also, the opportunity to get uh, some hardscape and playground that moves up a little closer to the building just to help with supervision, control, and access to those spaces. What's shown in red would be a potential uh, footprint of an addition to that building. And then the, on the left is the uh, kind of the white footprint of what is the current Sudlow building. Sudlow is a tough site because it's long, narrow, and it's uh, bounded by a very busy street on the south and uh, constrained streets on the other three sides. So logistics are going to be a challenge no matter how we approach it. Uh, brown would be playground and gray would be hardscape, which could be like your basketball courts or paved spaces that, that students want to play on. Uh, one thing to keep in mind at, at uh, uh, both Sudbow and Smart, some of the comments we've heard is it's really important to have those uh, playgrounds, 
basketball courts and green spaces because the community in those neighborhoods tends to make really good use of that. So we, we want to make sure we keep those uh, available uh, to, the, to the neighborhoods. If we were to start looking at a floor plan, I'm not going to explain every single space. It's more to give the idea of how we might start to approach this. As TJ said, uh, this has started with a, a very uh, broad view working from leadership and cabinet. Um, as we get to the timeline, I'll talk a little bit more of how the engagement process works. But in theory, we start with a general idea of, can we do this on this site? Is it feasible? Does it fit? So we, we've been exploring this. Uh, we've had some recent conversations to say, OK, are we shooting too far? Do we need to pull back a little bit? So we've, we've started to uh, tighten the belt a little bit to make sure we're not overdoing this. Uh, there's more to do. Uh, and that more to do will include better responding to the needs and the uh, the uh, opportunities that exist with, with uh, a project like this. In general, what you're seeing, the piece on the left is the existing first floor of the Sudlow building, and then what's shown in the uh, orange-red uh, color scheme on the right would be a potential addition. Um, part of this is an opportunity to uh, enhance the cafeteria space uh, or improve the opportunity for cafeteria. Uh, so maybe taking that old gym and turning it into a cafeteria, attaching a double gym to give uh, more opportunities for PE and instruction, providing in that addition uh, additional classroom space that could cover the needs of a, of a grade level house. Going back into those existing areas in the building and sort of re-injecting uh, uh, other programs or rethinking how those spaces work to provide for some of the programmatic needs in the building. Um, as we jump up to the second floor, what you're going to notice is Sudlow would require a two-story addition. Uh, again, as we've talked, Creative Arts Academy is uh, a really great asset in this building, uh, but it does uh, take a good portion of the footprint. Uh, so we uh, have a second-story addition that covers a lot of what is needed for additional grade level classrooms, again, to set up for another grade level house in this building, going back into those existing building areas and starting to uh, update and remodel and rethink how those might uh, come together. Um, if you notice on the first floor, it's really uh, a process of trying to establish a good uh, circulation path around the building, multiple opportunities to get through. It gets a little more challenging as you get up to the second floor. Um, we are trying to uh, uh, minimize the attachment point. Uh, it it uh, helps us in, in code <laughs> if we do that. Um, and then when we get up to the third floor, we do not need a third floor addition. However, we would want to go back and, again, start doing some additional remodeling and improvement within that building. Um, also, you know, there's an upstairs uh, multipurpose room. We, we would make use of that. It's currently not ADA accessible, um, but we would uh, improve that space to be ADA accessible so they can be utilized for, for functions where it might not get used uh, as well currently. If we jump into SMART, um, a lot of the same things apply at SMART as what you just saw at Sudlow. So additional cafeteria space to improve that efficiency uh, and, and help uh, produce a little better uh, supervision and control and create a little less time in lunch and more uh, instructional time for students. Additional classroom space to meet the needs of the additional students and programs, uh, as well as respond to that desire for a house approach in the building. Additional gymnasium space, uh, just to give a little better opportunity to create that instruction time for PE and large motor skill activities. Uh, improved spaces to allow that integration of FCE, CTE, and STEM. And then, like Sudlow, uh, improve the site safety uh, resolve some concerns with uh, logistics, parking, and create more opportunities for outdoor student activity spaces. Like Sudlow, uh, this 
uh, solution would also require the removal of the Monroe Elementary School building. So from a bird's eye view in the uh, Google helicopter, you're looking down on the what is really the entire campus, uh, 4th Street down to the very south. Um, the smart existing building footprint is in, in white in the center. You're seeing uh, potentially the footprint of an addition off to the east of that building where Monroe currently exists. That would be utilized to uh, uh, help us create additional green space, some hardscape, uh, playground, and, and outdoor activity space, uh, creating some additional opportunities for parking. And then again, there's some district property up at the north that could be uh, better utilized for some additional parking needs. Um, there are discussions about um, adjusting the street so that it is district owned and is utilized only for drop off and pick up. And uh, then we can start to help uh, change some of the flow of, of how traffic moves in that area. This is also a site that is tough. You've got a busy street to the south and you've got some tight neighborhood streets on the other three sides of this property. So it, it's gonna take some work to make sure that we're appropriately resolving some of the site logistics as it relates to buses, cars, and pedestrian traffic around the site. Uh, trying to create some closure in the street would help facilitate the movement of students and staff as they move between uh, green space, outdoor space, and the building itself. If we jumped into the first floor of the building, um, what you're seeing is a, a kind of an addition plan to the right side and the existing building on the left side and it's a very similar approach, except there's one big difference. Uh, at SMART, it's only a one-story addition. Uh, not having that creative arts footprint uh, creates a little bit more opportunity to uh, recapture and, and rethink some spaces in the building. But uh, in, in the existing building, it's really rethinking uh, how we might be able to go back and start filling in program and enhancing some of the spaces within the existing building maybe using that current gym as a cafeteria, adding a double gym to create a better uh, space for those PE and, and uh, physical activity spaces, um, creating a uh, series of classroom spaces on that first floor, starting to resolve that approach to uh, the, the house approach per grade level. And then as we jump up to second floor, it does become a, a solution of reworking how spaces are allocated and distributed throughout the building for resolving the needs of the grade level houses, as well as accounting for some of the instructional and curriculum needs within that building. And then the same would apply again at the third floor level, uh, just again, providing adequate space for grade level houses and the, the program and curriculum needs of that building. If we jumped forward to North High School, uh, the most dire need at North High School is the science rooms. These are rooms that were built originally uh, as a uh, middle school uh, approach. And so uh, they're small, they're old, and a good portion of the walls within this uh, building are uh, what they call demountable partitions. Those were never meant to be permanent walls. They were meant to be movable, uh, which cause a lot of issues with noise and uh, safety and security. Just they're, you know, they're, uh, they're not real thick and they're, they're uh, uh, probably not often moved even though they're made to be moved and flexible. Um, the idea here is to create new science rooms which would allow us to recapture that space and handle some of the needs of uh, updated and improved classrooms within the building. Uh, it's been expressed that uh, just a facelift to help and improve and enhance the main 53rd Street uh, um, facade of the building, um, which uh, would also give us an opportunity to improve and enhance that public secure entry on the south side of the building and uh, update and enhance the secondary student entries within the building. It's considered that it, it may be possible to look at an uh, addition of a media center space which would again allow us to go back into the core of the building and, and update for some curricular spaces in the core of the building uh, where they might be very impactful. 
so reconfigure the existing science classrooms and library to create new and improved classrooms and collaboration spaces. Um, and uh, that would be seen as a, a complete improvement to the academic environment in the building. Those updates would set the tone for future building improvements as they are able to occur within that building. So uh, getting a solution that works there starts to create a model classroom would, would, something, would be something that could be employed with future uh, renovation projects. So this is a uh, sort of a combined uh, site plan, floor plan together. Um, the idea is uh, we have some green space off to the east side of the building. Uh, that's a, a good spot to be able to add on. Uh, if we expand a little bit further than what that green space allows, we still have the opportunity to create additional parking to the south of the current parking lot so that we do not lose any uh, amount of parking stalls on that site. It was really important to note that we did not want to try to expand out to the west. Uh, the site is tight with how much space it uh, has for parking, so trying not to disrupt too much of the parking uh, is going to be critical. And to the north side of the building is a lot of that critical outdoor space that get, gets used uh, a lot. So uh, in addition, the uh, back side of the building has a lot of program spaces that uh, make it a little bit challenging to look at adding on. So if we uh, really look at keeping those curricular classrooms, uh, both in terms of addition and renovation, kind of in that core part of the building, it, it seems to make sense. So the idea is to consider a, uh, uh, science room addition to the building that's about eight science classrooms which would allow us to go back into that uh, current science portion of the building and uh, we would try to recoup enough space to get eight uh, updated and improved classrooms as well as some flexible use space in that building that's much needed for uh, small group interaction special ed and, and some other functions that occur there if we were able to move the media center off into an addition, we can actually start to rethink that space at the very core of the building to uh, get some uh, additional improved classroom and instruction space and a little bit of collaboration area that's right at the heart of the building uh, where it might be very beneficial to the, to the needs of the students there. Um, that takes us into some other high school needs. So it's been discussed that each of the high schools would benefit from a multi-use, multifunctional turf field. Uh, that'd be something that could be used for practice, possibly competition, uh, but it would be used for outdoor uh, athletic and activity programs. So think of it being used for a multitude of sports, uh, PE, fitness, and, and other opportunities. Um, the idea, and, and we showed this picture before, but it's to create some kind of a field that is striped for football, striped for soccer, possibly has the line work and uh, set up so that it could be used for baseball or softball, uh, as well as any variety of other program needs. Um, we are showing a picture here of a double field, so two full-size soccer fields side by side, uh, one thing to note is for any of the high school campuses, we don't have enough space to do a double field. So what we're talking about is half of this, which would be a single field. So it would be a single soccer, football, baseball uh, combined. And it is uh, still going to be a very beneficial multifunctioning space that could be used uh, throughout the year, uh, uh, any time of the year, which is be a benefit to each of the schools. Um, we feel that there's adequate space to be able to handle the single field approach at west and at north on those campuses. However, at uh, Central, we'll see in a couple of minutes, it, it probably needs to occur at the Brady Street complex. Um, one thing that was very strong on the list of things that needs to be done is providing improvements to every elementary school throughout the district. So uh, in the phase one, it would be an undertaking of beginning the process of updating and improving each elementary school building. And that would include furniture, technology upgrades, and then really 
updating the appearance of, uh, of the space, brightening the finishes, new paint, possibly addressing some flooring and some ceilings and lighting, as well as provide some, uh, we call it in, in environmental branding, but some graphics and, and uh, um, image just to help identify the, the or, or create some of the uh, identification of you know, the school uh, logo and mascot and, and really create some uh, um, sense of, of place with each of these buildings. Um, and as, as we've looked before, um, some of the classrooms in our district are, are in great shape and some really need some, some update. And so there's a variety of ways you can start to improve that. But just the injection of color and uh, the type of furniture allows uh, students and teachers more opportunity to be flexible, multi-use, uh, try to uh, better suit the needs uh, of how they need to deliver the curriculum in their classroom. Um, color can do a lot to uh, uh, spark the minds. Uh, it, it is proven that color can uh, enhance the learning experience. Um, also dealing with better lighting and acoustics and, and things through our ceilings and floorings and lighting solutions will help. And then branding can be uh, anything from, you know, school mascot to uh, Davenport uh, regional uh, nomenclature to even providing the opportunity of enhanced learning experiences as students move through the, the building. So uh, coming up with a theme that uh, is identifiable and understandable to the students can be very successful for enhancing their outcomes at the elementary level. Uh, Brady Street Athletic Complex. So uh, we have uh, a couple issues down there and we have some opportunities down there. Uh, the baseball field currently is in a floodplain, and uh, there is a loss of, of use of that facility because of uh, flooding that occurs. Uh, that is not just this time of year when the Mississippi is flooding, but even major rain events do cause floods that uh, uh, take that field out of commission. Um, there is a, a opportunity to consider moving that field and at the same time, providing that uh, same kind of turf field solution for the central athletic teams that would uh, be happening at the west and north campuses. Um, might give us an opportunity to expand a little bit more parking in and around the stadium, as well as uh, possibly addressing some uh, uh, needs with the bus maintenance and storage, as well as the opportunity to consolidate properties and structures down on that site. And so, uh, if we start to think about uh, this campus, uh, inside the yellow boundary is, is uh, I believe, summarizes the district-owned properties. And uh, in theory, the baseball field would move across the street to a higher elevation. A good portion of where the baseball field is would have to be reconfigured to create a stormwater solution for that campus. Uh, and then... Uh, the residual green space that's in there could be uh, part of the solution for turf fields. Uh, it also would afford the opportunity for track and field events which occur inside of the stadium. Some of those bleed out to across the street. If those could come to the same side of the street, uh, that would provide some safety and security and logistics uh, resolution that are currently problematic there because uh, this street will need to be maintained. There's not an opportunity to close that at this time. From a timeline standpoint, this is uh, probably not a, a good timeline to look at. It's really small scale. Um, the thing to note is that uh, if this is a, a, an acceptable listing of projects, the goal would be to start working on these immediately. Some things in here can happen uh, uh, co coincidental to one another. So uh, immediately we would jump in and start doing elementary improvements. Uh, we could start making plans for uh, turf field solutions at the same time, and then start working on the larger projects with the idea that those uh, might fall uh, in a, a sequence of about a six month delay between projects. That six month delay is so that uh, we provide a construction sequence where contractors and the labor workforce and the material supply aren't overburdened by an in, 
a, a surge of too much volume of work at the same time. So creating a modest delay uh, from one project to the next should work well for getting things constructed uh, efficiently and, and uh, adequately, which also helps the bid pricing for the project. The other thing to note is each project has a series of events. There's schematic design, design development, and construction documents. In the schematic design process for any of these projects, what happens is we're doing big moves. Uh, so the floor plan you saw, I said it's not correct. There's big moves. Things are getting moved around, adjusted. Sizes might be shifting a little bit here and there. That is, an, is a process that becomes collaborative. We try to integrate a lot of opportunity for staff to be involved, to have a say in providing feedback and uh, insights into how those uh, projects can be more successful for those buildings. Um, as we get through schematic design, uh, we switch into something called design development. In that phase, we kind of say the big moves have stopped, but uh, we still need to refine and enhance what's there. So those user group conversations, those staff conversations still happen. We're just not making big changes at this point. We're really refining and enhancing. When it gets to construction documents, all of that kind of stops and we uh, really push forward to create a, a set of construction documents that's biddable and buildable by the construction community. What follows then is a, a process of bidding and then construction. Uh, any of these projects, construction, uh, uh, has a, a variety of ways of, of occurring in terms of duration. The best thing to keep in mind is for, for smart subbo and north, any project that's a uh, construction addition and remodeling, we're going to want to do as much addition as possible first so that there's space available that we can unburden the existing building and go back and do that remodeling. If we try to do it all at the same time, it's gonna be really, really disruptive and really messy, and it's already gonna be a complicated process. Um, and the fire alarms will go off, and uh, students will get uh, uh, lost in the construction area, and it's just a, it's just a mess. So. Um, there will be a, so, uh, a, an opportunity to push ahead as much as you can during summers. But as we all know, because uh, you guys are in a district and know how this works, you just can't get much done in a summer. So um, with the elementary uh, updates and remodelings, those would be projects that are really trying to get done through summers with painting work and, and improvement work. Um, However, some of that furniture may need to cycle uh, in phases. Um, additional projects. If revenue would allow, uh, whether it's phase two or priority two, um, additional projects that were identified are uh, the addition of cafeteria community room type spaces at elementaries that currently don't have them. Uh, there are a series of elementaries, uh, if not a majority of them, that need uh, update or replacement of playground spaces. As well, uh, I talked a little bit about the first project sort of setting a tone for future work at North High School. There is a need at the high schools for continued improvement and update of classroom and education spaces within those buildings. Uh, transportation and operation facility needs will need to be explored, again, uh, are we trying to s store buses? Are we trying to come up with a solution for how we deal with the, the maintenance and operation facilities, uh, which actually kind of ties in with a review of all ancillary properties uh, that are uh, owned and utilized throughout the district. It's worth an effort of really starting to investigate all the different ancillary properties and buildings because I am positive we will find additional efficiencies uh, with a good analysis of what's there. And then the other real big thing is, uh, as we've talked, once we uh, embark on uh, the middle school curriculum, it gives us the opportunity to really start strategizing that preschool solution throughout the entire district. So, thank you for not falling asleep through all that. It's a lot. I'm happy to go back through anything you wanna look at. Um, 
or if you just have some questions, uh, feel free. Director Beck. Um, I just noticed when you were, first of all, thank you. This is a good, uh, very informative presentation. Um, I noticed that in the, um, the Sudlow and Smart remodels, both of them end up creating like a courtyard um, between the old and the new additions. Is there, you said something about code. And so I was wondering, is there a reason for that? And is that a space that's usable for learning or is it just gonna collect dust or? Yes and yes. Um, <laughs> so there is a strategy to, strategy to creating courtyard space it is hard to smack an addition right up against a building because the first thing you do is block light and air. So having that courtyard space does give the ability to have open windows, access to natural light. We have found that uh, if the size and arrangement of that courtyard uh, is planned out carefully, it does provide for some uh, contained outdoor activity space. Uh, we have had, uh, any variety of solutions that's uh, some playground space, some outdoor classroom space. Uh, we've done it with uh, even just some uh, playground paving, but uh, using it more as like a large motor skill, just movement space. Uh, there are a lot of different things that you can do there. Uh, it just takes a little bit more exploration. Um, unfortunately, courtyards do catch some of the dirt and things like that. So uh, what we try to do is avoid, um, I think some of your buildings, you might walk through now and see a courtyard that's got a lot of overgrown grass. And the first thing you got to think is how do I get a mower in there? Uh, people tend to try to plant trees in there. How are you going to get the leaves out? We, we want to try to avoid those. And so um, making it a, a, a useful space is going to be beneficial. I, I like your description of a, like, a hard, kind of a harder playground surface. I'm thinking we should call it a wiggle room. Director Potts. Williams has a courtyard space. And for years, a pair of ducks went in there every spring, nested, and the kids in the building, I, the kids in the building would, would watch those ducks, watch them hatch, and, all, and then they'd open the, the they had an access, outside access, and they'd, on a certain day, they'd open the doors, and the ducks, it, it was like, what is that hotel down there where they march the ducks down? And the ducks would march out with the little ducklings out, out the door. They had a pine tree. Can, consider that an, an introductory to ag program. There you go. <laughs> That'll make Maxwell happy out at North Scott. I did have a, a just a comment. I, and I, I have, I have, I have a lot of questions that are too specific to be answered. Okay, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to ask you about access to the bathrooms. Is it going to be doors? Or is it going to be no? But I'm, a, I'm, I'd like to assume in the, these projects some attention is being given to the music rooms, specifically at Sudlow, uh, because. When, when the programs are booming, space is, is, it's hard to get 86 eighth grade band kids in some of the band rooms. The one band room is, the old library is, is a big enough room. Yes, that was part of the Sudlow conversation. Band is uh, very successful there, but there's only really technically one band room. There's an additional space that's choir orchestra that gets used for band a lot and so trying to create a solution that gives more space for that program. Yes. Yeah, and 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 just affirming what you've said, uh just talking to uh the building administration there that that was that is a problem currently hang on one second was that all you had there Scott? director Kleinsville. um i 
cafeterias in elementary buildings. How many buildings do we have without a cafeteria? Two? It's, it's more than uh, just adding a cafeteria. There are several buildings that need to get them out of the basement. Um, so the addition of those spaces, um, you can go back and look at those. Uh, but I would say right now it's half of them that would need that. That are eating in their gym instead of in a cafeteria. I, I get the basement part, but I mean, how many actually have to vacate their gym and not use it during the lunch time? I know, I think Eisenhower, yes, Jackson. Eisen, Eisenhower, Jackson. Oh, I, I had it written down and I, I don't think I have that open. Eisenhower, Jackson, Jefferson. Um, no, not Jefferson. Basement would be Garfield, uh, McKinley. Wilson. No, Wilson's upstairs. McKinley's in the basement. That era. We can get that information if you want. They Washington eats in the basement. Yeah. I guess seeing it as a phase two project, and I get the ones bringing them up out. But the ones who don't have anything, they're not eating in the basement, they're taking up the PE space, I see that as a, more of a priority. Just my thought on it, because I taught in a building one time where no PE because we got to use it as a cafeteria. Um, Sudlow, when, when we got one cent ta sales tax money and we redid all offices and libraries, um, was Sudlow Library renovated then? Yeah, it went from the third floor to the sixth floor. It's been the old, the old gym, it's now a library. And now we're talking about renovating again. So it, it bothers me that we put a lot of money into it not too long ago, well, probably longer ago than I think, and now we're doing it again. So I'm just throwing that out there. And I wouldn't focus too much on what the... How many? See, I told you it was longer ago than I thought. <laughs> I wouldn't focus too much on what that is. That's still going to need a lot of massaging in the front okay. end. Um, review of properties. While this is going on, I, I would like to see that timeline moved up because I think we do have some things that we need to look at, possibly get rid of. Um, and in the... Uh, looking at Brady Street Stadium and all of that, are, is there a thought about like tearing down those armory buildings and using that land? That probably is what exactly you're talking about, <clears throat> getting some efficiencies with our operations and auxiliary buildings. We have to really dig into how that works. We've been really focusing on the school buildings as a whole, classrooms, space needs there. That's where we're going to start looking into can an operations building of some sort move? Can can a maintenance department move? Can we move things out to where operations is and get rid of some other buildings? Or, or I mean, that's what that means. Well, if you're adding all the athletic things there and moving them around, it seems like there's space. Move it, and it's at least not flooding there. Yeah. Okay. We we've discussed that, and actually, some of those spaces would be also part of that ancillary property review uh, as we create a better understanding of what a solution for where buses get stored and maintained might even give us opportunity for additional sale of property or disposition of property in some way. So that'll be part of that review process. Director Beck, did you have one? Um, <clears throat> yeah, the, um, so I know um, the CAA has a theater room right now um, and it's kind of designed for that. I assume that's part of the plan is to make something that's theater, uh, theater room. But I'm wondering, are we able to do um, a room that could be used as a theater room in, say, smart if we're renovating um, or put in that type of space? Uh, because I know all the junior highs have drama clubs um, and that's one of those important extracurricular activities, a place where they can they can do that. Um, I know they all have auditoriums, correct? Or do they not all have auditoriums? No, actually they don't. They, they have uh, smart 
for example, would have a stage, but yeah, you know, it's in a gym, a, right? Gymatorium. Gymatorium. Yeah. So that's something to think about as we're putting money into these that, that we keep in mind that those are, you know, maybe not make PE and theater mutually exclusive. Uh, um, and then <clears throat> my other question has to do with the Brady street area. Um, if we own all of that property between that covers 36th street, um, between Brady street and, uh, I don't know, whatever, where the bus, the bus barn is right now. So that part of 36th street there, are we not allowed to, I mean, could we, if we own all that property, we don't right now, but if we did, could we not close it in? I mean, there might be drainage issues, but just, I mean, the city doesn't absolutely need access then through there, do they? <laughs> I'm so sorry, Bruce. <laughs> You'll just have to drive through the field. In general, if you own both sides of the street, you can make a request okay. to vacate. However, in an area like this where it might be considered a primary access route, uh, which in this case connects from Kimberly to Brady, uh, the city doesn't always uh, entertain those requests. Okay. Um, TJ? We asked, and it was uh, a no. When was that? Uh, about a month ago. Oh, okay. <laughs> All uh, right. At our city meeting, for exact reasons for safety and yeah. the thoroughfare that that create that that is there. Okay. As a pretty heavily. Yeah. Traveled road. I I would add that it sounds great to close that street. However, part of the parking solution would require that you have vehicular access partway anyway. So uh, yeah. you would actually run the risk of additional logistical problems if you have parking at one end and the other and you only had yeah. uh, hard paths to get there. So. Yes, that's true. OK. Director Posh. I think I, <clears throat> thinking along the same lines as uh, Director Klein Jerome, um, as far as the cafeterias and the elementaries and then preschool, um, I think both of those need to be um, brought up higher in priority. Um, and maybe we can do some juggling as far as some of the um, uh, sports facilities and that. And don't get me wrong, I'd, I'd love to see some of that there, but we've got to kind of pick and choose here. My concern is, is or a couple concerns, when you're talking about sports facilities, we are, we are only providing a half-time AD with it for a district that has three high schools in it. Um, and then yet we've, we're putting all, pouring all this money into facilities. And to me, that doesn't make sense. And then when we talk about getting this money closer to the kids, um, to me, number one is, is preschool. Um, and then again, with the cafeterias, we, we've got to come up with something bit better. Uh, I'm in the cafeteria at Madison almost once a week and that is, yes, it's a separate area, but it is not ideal. Um, so if we're talking about getting, you know, getting the money uh, closer to the students, um, I think we need to move that up and um, put more priority on it. Now I realize we need the room for the preschool, and so that will probably require some remodeling or additions at some of the elementaries but um, I just I just don't think that we want to put off uh, with the preschool because again if we can get our touches earlier on these kids so that they get exposed earlier that makes a lot of other problems go away down the road. Uh, 
there to find your online address. I, I just have a quick uh, reconfigure existing classrooms at North. Does that mean those folding walls are going? So the area at the core of the building and this, the current science room areas, wherever we touch and remodel, yes, we would change those. But uh, there may still be some areas where those exist. Uh, it's, uh, it is something that uh, when we go back with new walls, we take them all the way up. We make sure they're sound uh, isolating between classrooms. Um, yeah, they need to go. Yeah, they're, uh, from what I understand, the district has changed some of them. There's some that still exist. Wherever we're touching a remodeling within that building, those would go. We would go back with a permanent wall. We would also address any of those other uh, maintenance and repair needs in those areas as we're doing that too. Director Potts. Yeah, I think those portable walls things, that was the idea of a great concept imposed upon teachers that didn't want any part of it. I would assume once we offload sixth graders back to the intermediates, then immediately there's, I mean, sixth graders in the elementaries are taking up three or four classrooms at least. Offload those out. You got a preschool room in every elementary available. Boom, right there. You got to put in little shorter toilets and you got to put in little shorter sinks and get little tiny chairs, you know. But other than that, and, and that's correct. And, and going back to Director Poshton's comment, um, when we unburden space, we, we uh, there's two things happening. We have some additional students in buildings because we closed some. But as we start to understand what's available, there may be some residual space that easily accepts uh, some preschoolers. We would have to do a little bit of modification for toilets and sinks, but uh, that may be a, a smaller uh, scale solution. You're exactly right um, with that comment. And we have a team right now. We're hoping that this time next year, we would be rolling out our, a pretty comprehensive plan for preschool, um, knowing that they're most effective in our district in the buildings. Um, but also understanding the need for centers and also the state is really pushing for preschool centers right now. So there's lots of funding available to, for those. Um, Tif Tiffany Stallcup, Mr. Driscoll, Courtney Olson, and Diane Campbell are beginning with our finance people, with Kevin, are beginning to look at that. Um, we're evaluating how to special education work with general education how do we maximize the number of spots is it one classroom in each building is it two um, what's the level of support that's needed and so all of that all of that work i would consider that up there it says phase two but that's more of a phase one issue as i would consider that you're spot on that it's a high priority need and it's going to be something that we're doing right alongside with the ancillary properties with things of that nature so I, and and i Glad to hear our board say it's a high priority because it is for us as well. All right, and a follow up then. Also, it's conceivable that once the sixth graders are gone and all the dust settles, we may find opportunities to close additional facilities at that level. I would say that we would definitely have the opportunity to revisit our long range facility plan. Mm -hmm. One of the great things that Bray has done for us is there's pauses built in. And so when we looked at where uh, facility plans have been successful around the state, it's where built in pauses are, are there. Um, the pauses are really important because we have to see how, how, what, what are the impacts and effects of phase one. And so, um, that is already built into that 26, 27 time frame, but that doesn't mean we have to sit on our hands throughout that time. We have plenty of work to do in that framework. So yes, there is an additional reevaluation, just like um, the board has set a precedent for uh, reevaluating our boundaries as students and families move. This is something that needs to be reevaluated on a regular basis. Hang on one second. I'm going to ask a piggyback off of Director Potts. Um, and I think Directors uh, Klein, Jerome, and Poshin kind of hit on it too. So I'm, 
in my mind, along with what Director Potts was saying, I'm seeing the elementaries are kind of more to the back to see what is available because potentially there could be room for a cafeteria or a space to move that cafeteria when it's not um, full of the sixth graders and things like that. In my construction mind, that's kind of what I'm seeing because you don't want a ton of uh, items that you have to move around and do that because then you're, you're just creating more work when if you let the dust settle, then you kind of have and see what you have and then look at building efficiencies even more in depth because we've already said we're focusing on the junior high level, which that's there and then we'll have to look at some of the other things. But I'm just, in my mind, I'm seeing that's kind of why that stuff was a little bit later to see where things were at after the other things got moving. I, I think that's correct. Um, as those sixth graders move out, then uh, kind of verifying where our enrollment is going for each of those buildings and how that affects the use of uh, curriculum and program spaces in those buildings will give us a better understanding of the efficiencies you can gain. And it will be different for every single building uh, because the uh, enrollment uh, will vary and the size of building and the space available varies building to building, but uh, I, I think you're spot on. Director Beck. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, um, I think I, I agree with what's been said about making preschool a priority. We've been talking about it for a long time. Um, and I guess I like the idea of sort of taking advantage of the space that's there to at least get the preschools going. And then as long as we can do it, you know, with the right standards and everything. Um, and then, you know, we can sit back in phase two and say, okay, where do we need to modify this plan? Because I agree with <clears throat> Director Postion that the earlier we get the kids into school, the more likely they are to read, the more likely they are to stay in school, and the fewer problems we'll have, everyone will have down the line. So. Director Potts. Two things and I'm done. One, we also need to remember we have a K-8 issue in the West that we're going to have to deal with, which will certainly increase our attendance at board meetings. Second thing, and this is a question, is I, if I remember when, when my mutts were in elementary school at lunch, they were outside a lot. They ate and they were out. So the, the time that they're spending in their eating spaces is not very long, and then they're out. And I think if it's in, I think it's like, I mean, those kids, when I look out of my office window at Saddle of Washington, it was cold out and they're outside, winter coats and they're outside. And if it's that worse than that, don't they, this, the, the buildings that have auditoriums, they went to the auditorium and watched a movie or cartoons or, you know, Roadrunner. <laughs> so I, I, I would think if we start looking at elementary cafeterias or whatever, we, we, we probably need to maybe, I don't know, do a little cost benefit. How much time are they gonna be there? Uh, they don't, I mean, it's not like, they don't even have kitchens really there. Food's prepared and brought in in most of the places. So they come in, they eat, and they're out the door. Uh, in the junior highs, we last bunch of years, we haven't had the opportunity to go outside just because the, f the feeding regiment was such, it, it was very regimented, and uh, we lost their places to go outside, actually, and had nobody to supervise them when they were outside, except you could wave as they ran down the street. One of the things I can address with that is less about the seating space and more about the service space, just uh, having multiple line opportunities to get kids moving through there. That, uh, was identified as a problem in both SMART and SUBLO. It, it is very troubling to have a lot of kids cycling through a single service line. So if we can get it set up for two lines of service, it'll help that flow and improve that sequence. So that's a lot of what you're saying there. Director Hayes. Thank you so much. 
I was actually, you kind of answered it then. I was wondering with the larger cafeterias, would that reduce the, the different schedules or shifts that they go to lunch? Another question that I had, thank you for that also. Another one is on slide number 18, that front larger red area. Is that like the flexible area that you can use for on the south side of the of the um, the front area there? Is that the more of the um, flexible area? Part part of that was an idea that uh, getting and that that footprint is probably a little bit too big, uh, but getting a, a media center community space up front in the building and and the idea is it's. It's more visually a focal point. It becomes part of that aesthetic solution from that 53rd Street side of the building. But what it also does is it creates an opportunity for more community use in that space in a secure setting where if it's near the exterior of the building, you can get egress and ingress to that space without opening up the whole building. Currently, that media center is tucked into the heart of the building, so wayfinding to get there can be a little bit of challenging. Uh, also, it does mean that anybody that gets to that current location gets anywhere in the whole building as well. So uh, this tries to create a more uh, uh, focal point on the exterior, more available to the community and, and families to use. And then, uh, again, just part of that strategy of solution of, of that aesthetic improvement to the facade of the building. For Smart and Sudlow, do you have any idea approximately how many more parking spaces it would add to both of those campuses? I think we have an approximate count, but it's too small of a scale for me to read without it getting blurry. So uh, we can uh, tell you, um, I believe uh, we had a target number we were trying to hit, and um, we'll just have to validate that it's possible to get there. And, and that is to resolve some of those uh, staffing needs for those buildings. The reason I ask is going to both of those schools, it's some, well, not too much as smart as Sudlow. It's just so hard to figure out where you're going in residential areas, and it's just kind of tough. So I was just kind of wondering approximately how many. That's a good point. And the other point to keep in mind, and it, it applies to both Smart and Sudlow, is you're currently creating a burden on the neighborhoods where those buildings are because there's not enough opportunity for drive loops and parking. And so uh, that's going to take a little bit more work to make sure that we can help just unburden some of the pressure of the neighborhood by people parking on the streets or having to do extra driving on those streets. Director Beck. Um, yeah, I just want to clarify um, on Sudlow. Do we is that our parking lot? That little corner on uh, Esplanade and okay. Um, yeah. So and then the one on the far side of the building on the uh, west side of the building. Um, that one's always struck me as sort of like not well striped. Like it could definitely be a more efficiently used parking lot without even necessarily repaving it. But is that something else that could be looked at? Yes. I think and it has can, the dumpsters in it I, too. And well, so part of the issue, and if we can do this well, that parking lot that's off to the uh, west side is also where you're trying to back up trucks, pull in uh, dump trucks and, and do deliveries if that service area for cafeteria needs moves, now we can handle that off a drive loop and we, we can better use that as parking space and not have to worry about the trucks coming in and there, in and out of there. Also, that is a little bit of an unsightly zone. So, you know, anything we can do might help that as well. Director Poshin. Both on, on Sudlow and Smart, it, it just seems to me that uh, with the addition and everything, everything still looks pretty tight. Now, your, what is your thought on the green space there? I mean, is there a formula or whatever you use for 
uh, the amount of green space you need for that site? So the formula is probably going to be more for, as it relates to parking. And then uh, we, we really do want to try to get as much parking as, as you're going to need. And then uh, we are trying to preserve green space. Um, in general, it'd be nice to try to have at least a football field size green space for each of those buildings. And that's kind of the, the goal there is to have at least a football field sized space. If we can get more than that, it would be great. Um, but as you've noted, it is, it is a tight site. The other issue that we uh, face at uh, Sudlow, we're bounded by some elevation change. So the grade level changes along Locust. And mm -hmm. so we have to be careful that we can't encroach too much to the street or we're in a hill uh, situation. So like when, <clears throat> when you look at this, the way it is right now, to me, it looks like we're going to be just as tight as we are right, we are right now. Um, and so I don't know how you get around that. Are, are we showing the, the, the entire uh, footprint there, even all the way to the east? Yes. That east edge there, that's... Uh, the the that uh, right side of the, of the <laughs> picture is Eastern Avenue. Okay. And again, these aren't the perfect answer. These are just a, a, a shot out of the, the gate here. And so we will have opportunities to, to try to improve what you're seeing here. Um, and that even goes as far as your, your question earlier about courtyards and, and how we address those as well. Can, can you pull up the smart footprint? And to me, you know, we're, we're dealing with the same thing here now. Is, um, on the north there, it says uh, parking, but in between existing parking and possible parking, we don't own that ground in between. There's two pieces of property that are unowned. There is property owned here and property owned here. There is currently some hardscape space here that we're trying to pull down and nest in with all the other outdoor spaces so those can be grouped together. So uh, again, creating some opportunities for playground, basketball, things like that. And then the other, the other approach here is that this addition is attempting to navigate the fact that there's a, a, a grade level issue from the main entry to the building uh, down to this sidewalk. So creating a, a grade level solution here so that you're, you're walking in at grade level, that movement uh, across the street is kind of all at that same level. And our touch points are where we handle those elevational changes from, from floor level to floor level. But do we want our, our green space and, and uh, open area right up against 4th Street? If I'm not mistaken, there's a bu isn't that line there a buffer between our practice facilities? So it would be, it would be set back far enough with fencing along there to where... We explored two different opportunities. One was uh, using that, what's, what's identified as, as just kind of buffer space using that as parking. The concern we had is that really makes people have to walk uh, you know, a full block to get to the building. So we opted to try to utilize the uh, east side of the property to, to create a little bit better uh, walking path. Uh, but then, yes, as TJ noted, this, this would be a buffer zone, this little rectangle. Yeah. I also think it'd be you know, the people that live and breathe at Sudlow for the practice facility for that space, the PE teachers, the principals, the community will have some really good ideas for that as well. Director Beck. Um, that brings up a good point um, because I think, you know, I know I mentioned that, that, that you know, we've got track 
teams at every middle school, but they're trying to do hurdles on a sidewalk, which is just terrible. Um, and it, oh, I can't watch. Um, <laughs> and so having, even if it's not a full lap track around that football field, having some stretch of track space would be, I think, really important. You know, they run around the neighborhood for their distances and things, but having an opportunity to help them, you know, to give them a place to do that safely, I think is, is important as well. And I know, as, as TJ said, asking the PE teachers and the community what they think would be an, beneficial. Another interesting solution, it is a, uh, a shortened distance, but bounding hardscape and playground space with a uh, resilient pathway that can be used for that purpose has been very beneficial at that age. It doesn't have to be a full quarter mile. Um, so it might be a, a, a shortened, you know, 200 meter or something loop, but that, uh, and it may only be two or three lanes versus, you know, six, but that's been very beneficial because that might employ some of the same uh, material that's already going to be on the playground anyway. And if you look at these facilities now, right now, the only land that SMART has is connected right to SMART. And there's a little bit of a baseball field that they have access to. And so this will be an overall, I mean, just for square foot, an overall improvement, especially if you have a, a distance for them to practice their hurdles and things of that. Because right now, Monroe is very similar to McKinley, where there's a walking track around. I'll ask my questions now. Um, and no one actually really touched on this part, but I, I appreciate the fact that the elementaries were included. Whether it's the fresh coat of paint or whatever, I really truly believe, um, especially, I mean, kids aren't the same as they were when I was a kid or when anyone else here was, but I think that, you know, the brighter colors and things like that, and when they see something fresh in their school, they get more invested, and it's kind of like a re reinvigorated, rejuvenated, however you want to look at it, rather than having, you know, a dungy color that's been there for 23 years or something like that. So I appreciate the fact that that was included in this. Um, and then it feels like a lot of the buildings are getting their touches because uh, I feel being on this board for a while now, and I feel this is the first time we've actually really looked into our district and the things that we need and address it. And clearly there are so many needs that we're not going to be able to do them all at once. But I think um, kind of the direction you guys have it laid out now, I think that's a big impact to show our community that we are investing in this because we will have to go out for a bond probably to get some other things done. And I think when people see that, you know, we put up the money to front a lot of this, and then if we go back, and I think it'll be a little bit easier of a sell that, hey, we are putting our money where our mouth is. We're investing in the kids in the district, uh, trying to give, you know, some of these areas. Because each school is its own little community. And if we're able to revitalize those communities and things like that, like having, you know, hardscapes and things down at um, the smart campus, Sudlow campus, and things like that, I think that's, that's a huge game changer and it helps in investing in that stuff. Um, I want to be clear on this. This is your all's kind of recommendation, what you see going for phase one, but when we start the process, because you're looking for feedback on what we want, but when we start the process of phase, each thing will have to be voted on. Is that correct? So the general scope is uh, a phase one that includes all these projects, each individual one will come to the board with greater detail as we move along. Uh, we wouldn't want to lump these all together as a, a single effort, so to speak. Um, there's, there's a lot that goes into every single one of these. And so as we start to break those out in sequence as they happen, we'll start to talk about them individually. But what we, we want to, to kind of address with the board is that the magnitude of what's included in phase one is is the approach that feels right to the board and the district. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, basically, you kind of want a consensus. Is this what we see going? And then we would vote on phase one, including these things with more detail later on. Um, and one other thing for myself personally, I would not like to have these maps up here because that is a huge safety risk because anybody can see the layouts of our buildings where classrooms are and in the current state of affairs. Uh, I do not like that at all. So I would like if that stuff came in, be blacked out or something just because it's the day and age we live in. It's sad to say that, but I definitely don't want to look back on that. You know, I'm sure any of my colleagues here wouldn't want that. And I, I understand that we have to put some of that stuff out. And I would love to check with our attorney on some of that stuff because some things, I mean, maybe we can talk about it in a different setting, but I don't think that that stuff should be blasted on the news or, you know, the paper or anything like that, you know, because we don't want to put anybody at risk. It's my personal opinion. Um, so what I'm going to do now, I'll kind of go around unless anybody has any other questions and kind of get a, a consent. Hang on, let me get that out and then I'll yeah, go that's through. Good. And then get a consensus on um, if people are comfortable with where the phase one plan is at or some things they would like to see in. Uh, Director Kleindrom has a question. So how soon will you be bringing this to the board for us to vote on? And are we voting on something that looks like that this is phase one? Or are you going to say, here's what we are going to do with SMART, and we just vote on that? And here's what we're going to do with Sedlow? Or is it all-encompassing of the phase one that we were presented tonight? And how soon? Well, I think, I think we want the consensus of the direction. So if this is the direction we're going to go, we've gotten some pretty good feedback. We've got some things to consider during phase one. Um, obviously, if we're going to do the renovation of SMART, what we're looking for is this the timeline. Because in order for us to get this done by 2026, 2027, we've got to get going right away. Um, we have to start calendaring things. We have to start getting things moving. So essentially, this is what we would like to approve as a calendar of timelines, and then from there, be able to bring forward the scope of the work, individual projects, things of that nature. So what we're requesting, and help me chime in here, what we're requesting is that, that this is the, the, the direction that we should go, this is the appropriate phases that we should go and, and go in that direction. So that's what we're asking for feedback today. We would like to vote it as soon as possible. To start the phases. Exactly. To, to start the phases, but each individual project will be voted on in exactly. the detail. Okay. Yep. Initially, we're going to vote on we approve this concept. We approve this this preliminary blueprint. And then we will be voting on the specifics of each of the steps in the phase one. I'll start with Director Hayes. I agree with the plan as it's laid out. One question I forgot though with the um, two buildings, Washington and Monroe, does the monies that you mentioned include the demolition of that or is it something that we'll give to a group, a fire department or something to practice the, and? The overall budget does include uh, the disposition of those buildings, uh, and it actually includes some of the uh, uh, um, abatement cost that's also going to be necessary for those buildings. Uh, if there's an opportunity for some uh, training or, or something in there, that's always worth, worth discussion. Um, uh, but uh, as it stands currently, uh, full demolition is included. I'm okay with it. Director Beck. I mean, I'm fine with the proposal. I mean, the way we've laid out the proposal, yeah. Or the idea for voting on things. Okay. Um, Director Kleindrill. 
Um, I still have some concerns about some elementary buildings not having a cafeteria, um, but overall, uh, I guess I agree with if we push the athletic stuff to the last point and focus on the Sudlow North uh, Smarts, the actual buildings before we jump to the other things. Um, and just one quick question, are teachers going to be able to pick what kind of classroom furniture they get or is it going to be everybody in this building is getting this kind of furniture or like can they have desks if they want desks versus tables? I think it would be important to establish a district standard. Um, no desks. And so, I, I, well, I, th I think it's important to establish a district standard. Is that what you're saying? To, to just say there's a catalog order, whatever furniture you like? Well, if we all want desks or tables, then that's one thing. But maybe I don't want tables, I want desks. Do I get that option to say, nah, I'm not going to, I don't want those tables? So that's, that's going to be something that we have to work out. I don't okay. have an answer for that. I know in the past when we tried to accommodate each teacher and then the teacher moves and then it's very difficult inside of a, a district our size to accommodate that. That's why in the past we moved forward with a district standard. Okay. There are different technologies um, that allow for collaborative learning and individual spaces because I know the question that you're, you're, you're asking. And so I think there's technology out there that allows for both. Okay. Yeah, so I can live with this. There's there's a lot of strategies that can be had there, and that's a that is a probably a much later conversation, but will happen during the process of design. From from my standpoint in the warehouse, and I think some people work out as far as deliveries. It is nice to have a standard set like we talked about, and then I can keep ten chairs, ten tables that have three different colors that we can shift throughout the district if there's a need. Rather than just a, if you walk into some buildings, I'm sure you've seen it. There is just a mix of whatever we got, and we've put it in there in the past. So we're trying to go away from that. Director Potts, I'm good with it. Director Pasha. When you look at this and you think about, you know how many students you're going to touch um you know obviously we have to do something with smart and subtle you know I, I get that um but i still feel that with the caf some of the cafeterias and with with preschool um you know we've closed three elementaries we need to also do something with the elementaries and this is where we'll get the most um exposure to uh, as many um, students as possible and have more of a direct effect on the students. So I, I would just like to see that moved up. I know it comes down to dollars and cents after a while too, um, but we've got to think about, uh, you know, getting getting to these kids earlier and, and making some sort of impact on all our buildings so that everybody you know, buys into the what what we're doing, and uh, you know, if we could wave a magic wand and make it all done tomorrow, that, that would be great. Um, but again, I I still feel strongly about uh, moving the preschool and and the cafeterias up on the consideration. To to address a little bit of that, <clears throat> we are. And we have been budgeting around $500,000 each for each elementary building for improvements in those buildings. So we're trying to touch each and every building, you know, the best we can. Like you said, we have a budget we have to try to keep within. But um, we think that would be a good start for a little bit of a refresh. So some of those numbers we're talking about do include that. And that's good. I mean, that that's fine. But I'm still thinking about... You know, we keep talking about <clears throat> put the money where where we can do the most good with the kids. And if there's something else better than having more preschool, then, you know, tell me what it is. Um, so I think we, we can, <clears throat> we, we still need to focus on that. And uh, if we, if we want to correct some of the issues that are going on, whether it's our test scores, attendance, 
let's get a hold of these kids earlier on so that they, you know, are instilled in them, uh, you know, what they need to do and, and to, you know, get the best possible education that they can. I'm good with as presented. I would like to see the timeline on when you're looking at doing the preschools and things like that. Myself personally, I think when you go to a district and invest, you're invested in the high school because that's the high school you want to go to. Um, it's just been what I've seen with all of other parents coming along now. Um, but I do, we do need to have that touch in the elementaries and things like that. And I understand we have to wait till something's moved out to free up that room because I would hate to go build something brand new there and then the kids move out and then we got a bunch of empty rooms. Um, and I think we are going to have to look at some other buildings too along the way and doing some of these things will help us uh, figure out our deficiencies and where we can make improvements and things like that. So. Um, Along those lines, is there anything, any other direction that you all need from the board or questions? Um, I would just like to clarify, but just uh, Director Gordon stepped out to go to her students conference. That's why uh, we're, we're not calling on her, but we'll get her feedback at, at a different. But thank you for being considerate, Bruce. Um, so for us, for us, the the feedback that we've received is let's see a plan for preschool, which is outstanding. I'm glad to hear our board prioritizing that. And then what analyzing the needs of our cafeterias and those spaces, but also um, a timeline, which I think we have worked that out and we have recommendations for that uh, as well. And so. That's the feedback that I think we've heard from the board, and we'll we're, we're going to employ a um, a Gary Sinclairism, as we can do anything we want, we just can't do everything we want, and so we are going to do the best to prioritize um, those needs because we think they're important as well. Um, so it's been a very very beneficial um, night for us. And so, I, I, Josh, or is there any Josh and John? Is there any other things that you think you need from the board? No, or I Kevin, think, I think that was pretty clear. As we were sitting here, Suzanne Gerlock emailed me, so we're going to be connecting tomorrow. And and I would just echo TJ's sentiments. This has been very helpful to to get the feedback from you all as as you look through the thought process that we've uh, sort of put into developing this plan further. Uh, this is very good. So uh, our effort will be to continue uh, further defining and enhancing the information so that it is more and more understandable as we talk in the future. Thank you all for the great presentation. Board members, thanks for the input. And with that, Director Potts, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed, same sign. Ayes have it. Meeting adjourned.